All right, so we're talking a little bit more about statistics. In particular today, we want to talk a little bit about bias. So bias is something that we've probably heard before, but today I want to define what bias is and really talk about how it uh, affects our studies. So bias is pushing the response on our variable in a particular direction. And as you might suspect, bias is not good. It's fairly bad when we're talking about observational studies. So what is bias? Bias is pushing the answer in a certain direction. So how do we kind of think about that in the way that you might already be thinking about bias? It's just like being this bad thing that shows up in studies. Well, the idea is that if we ask the question in a certain way or if we ask a certain type of people, we're going to end up pushing our answer in a, in a, in a certain direction that's not necessarily great. So, for instance, suppose that I am talking to Wayne State University students and I want to know about how they feel about online courses. If I was to ask a convenient sample, maybe I just asked all of my online course students, how do you feel about online courses? It's convenient, which means that they're easy to get to. And if they're easy to get to, they must have something in common. In this case, they would all be taking an online course. Well, this is kind of problematic, because if I ask you what you feel about online courses, then by simply asking a convenient sample, because you have that in common, you're probably either going to feel pretty good about it or pretty bad about it, depending on how your online course is going. And so this is not really indicative of what all Wayne State University students feel. Maybe it's pushing it, hopefully, in a positive direction. You're all like, well, online courses are great. And maybe Wayne State University students don't necessarily feel that way, but we can see that it's pushing it in that direction. It's great. Voluntary sample is when I go out and I ask volunteers. So people actually volunteer their responses. With online courses, it's kind of difficult to say why voluntary samples would have bias. But I can tell you this, as soon as you have a voluntary sample, it automatically has bias. Because people who volunteer their answers automatically have something in common. It's easiest to see when it's a little bit more insane. So for instance, I could say, um, how do you feel about, what if I went out into the middle of campus and I said, how do you guys all feel about Donald Trump? The thing that's going to happen is, I'm going to have some people come up to me and go, oh, I can't stand the guy. And I'm going to have some people come up to me and say, he's the greatest. And the, the reason why this is going to happen, we're going to be pushed in those two different directions, one towards great, one towards awful, is because people who volunteer their answers typically feel strongly about their answers. You don't take time to walk over and say, Donald Trump, um, yeah, whatever, I'm pretty indifferent to the guy. Nobody's going to walk over in the middle of a sea of screaming people to say that they're indifferent. They're going to feel strongly about it. So voluntary samples are always going to pull in that voluntary push, that bias. If I asked you how you feel about online courses as a voluntary sample, go out in the middle of campus, I'm sorry, it's not going to have as much bias. It's not going to be pushed in a certain direction much as, as far. But simply by asking people to volunteer, the fact that they volunteer means that they have something in common. And so it's going to push it in a particular direction. And so it will contain bias. Simple random sample does not have bias because we're actually giving everybody a chance of being chosen in our sample. So we're not going to have bias. There's no particular direction that's going to be pushed in. It might not be the same as the entire population, and that's what we call variability. But it will have no bias. And a census is when we ask every single person in the population. For instance, the United States Census, we go out and ask every single United States citizen about where do they live or how much money they make and stuff like that. So a census is not going to have bias either. So these two samples are pretty good, and these two samples are not when it comes to bias. Then you might ask, why the hell do we have them? And the reason why we still have convenient sample and voluntary sample is because sometimes it's just impossible to do a simple random sample. Sometimes, sometimes convenient sample might not be that bad when it comes to uh, bias. So for instance, hair color. What if I asked all my Wayne State students that I teach what color their hair is, and I wrote it down? Is that bias? Well, yeah, technically it is. 
there might be some weird thing. Like maybe I'm teaching all freshmen, and maybe all freshmen were born in a certain year, and maybe all that certain year water was tainted with some type of chemical that fell from the sky, and that chemical just happens to make your hair brown. Who knows? It's possible that some bias exists. Simply because the people on my convenience sample have something in common, there is some level of bias. Although, you could argue that, although it does have some level of bias, that bias is probably fairly minimal because we're talking about something like hair color. And so our convenience sample, although not representative of the population, still gives us an idea about the hair color of Wayne State students or something along those lines. These samples are still pretty decent. Voluntary sample, maybe if I ask people like how they feel about their current movie theater, when they volunteer their responses, maybe I want to know the people that are upset so I can make those changes. Um, there are other things that show up as well when it comes to experiments, and, and there are other biases as well. So other biases, these are called sampling biases. Other biases could show up simply in the way that you ask a question. So it's like the question type bias. Maybe if I'm a police officer and I come to your house and I ask you about the crime that's been committed on your block. There might be a bias there just simply because I'm dressed up as a police officer and you don't really want to answer my questions. Or maybe you do want to answer my questions because you're really tired of your neighbors doing horrible things. Um, or maybe it's the way I ask the question. There are a lot of question type for bias. So if I'm looking at questions and the questions are worded in a way that makes me want to feel a certain way. So for instance, like if I said something like, you like our current uh, primary candidates, right? You do, don't you? By kind of pushing you in that feeling of like, I'm kind of telling you how I feel, and now you feel like you're supposed to answer, and yeah, sure, they're great. It doesn't really help anything, right? So if I'm giving you a, a, the way that I'm writing the question, it might be pretty bad uh, when it comes to bias as well. In experiments, experiments have things called lurking variables. So if you're doing an experiment and you, when I talk about a lurking variable, it's just a variable that might actually come into play. That's not necessarily like something we're trying to measure in the, in the experiment. So for instance, suppose that I'm doing an experiment where I want to figure out whether or not um, writing with your right hand or your left hand is, is easier to do. So say that I, I take people and I make them write with their opposite hand and I want to show whether or not... Um, having like loud music makes a, a difference in the, I don't know, this is really weird already, but suppose that I'm having people write with their non-dominant hand and I have the treatments are different types of music and I want to see if that kind of creates some type of stress and makes it difficult for you to write. Um, a lurking variable might be like, what if your hand is broken? Or what if your fingers are uh, broken or something like that. Something that I didn't really want to study, I just wanted to figure out whether or not the music had a, an indication on it. And it shows up in my study anyways. So that could be fairly problematic when it comes to experiments. There's also this thing called the placebo effect. A placebo is something that I give uh, as one treatment that's kind of like the control group. And the placebo, when given, is supposed to make it so that you don't know whether you're taking like Tylenol or not. So suppose I'm trying to figure out whether or not Tylenol gets rid of a headache. The placebo would be like a sugar pill that I give you to try to see whether or not it gets rid of your headache. The idea is that the placebo effect would be that I took something so it must get rid of my headache. Now if I took the sugar pill and all of a sudden I'm getting rid of my headache, maybe what I'm actually feeling is what's called the placebo effect. Just the fact that I took a treatment makes me feel like it's working. To get the placebo effect out, what we end up doing is we try to have the control group and we try to have the treatment that we actually want, and then we compare the results. If 50% of those that took Tylenol got rid of their headache, while only 10% of those that took the placebo got rid of their headache, then we say that Tylenol probably works. But if 50% of Tylenol patients got rid of their headache and 50% of placebo patients got rid of their headache, we would say that... Talent doesn't really work. It's just a placebo effect that they're probably actually feeling. So that's something that we might want to get out of our study. Um, and then there are other things as well that might show up. So for example, um, it double blind experiments. If, we, if we're talking about an experiment, um, if the experimenter knows who took what, they might know that you're feeling the placebo effect and they might question you on it. So you took the placebo, they know it, and then they, and then, so I'm an experimenter, you took a placebo, and I ask you, did you get rid of your headache? And you say, yes. I know you took the placebo. 
Are you sure you got rid of your headache? That's kind of problematic because it pushes the answer in a certain direction that we don't want it to be pushed because I, I've now made you question yourself. How do I get rid of that? I make it so that I don't know which one you took. So now when I ask you, did you get rid of your headache? You say yes. I don't know if you've taken the placebo. I don't know if you've taken uh, the Tylenol. I just know you took something. And so I don't question you anymore because I don't actually know. So if you don't know, it's a single blind experiment. And you should never know because you shouldn't know if you're taking Tylenol or the, or the uh, placebo. If I don't know as well, it's a double blind experiment because now two people are blind to what's actually going on. And then later on, maybe we have your number assigned to what you took and we can figure out still whether or not the uh, Tylenol works. There are all sorts of things that can go wrong in an experiment. Um, and, and knowing that makes it easier that when we're looking at articles on Facebook or in the newspaper or things like that, we can identify, good God, they use something really biased and, and their, their, their results are tainted because of it. And that's what we want to try to figure out.